How many of you guys feel like God's still got something for you? Okay, so here's what I'm going to ask. I'm going to make you guys a deal. I'm going to make you guys a deal. Um, I'm going to do my very best. I'm going to preach my very best, okay? And I wanna, I'm going to ask you to do your very best listening and open up your heart to the Lord. Is that a deal? Yep. Okay, so turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I believe God's still got something for me. So stop bothering me. I don't want you to look at me. Hey, I said stop looking at me. I want you to pay attention. All right. All righty. All righty. I'm excited to be here. I've been uh, uh, doing this for a long time and I've been to a lot of future quests and I've been sitting up there the last uh, five sessions during just worship and just weeping and just God burdening me for you guys. You know that the Lord really loves you and he really wants all of you. And, um, and so I want to just, I want to, I want to just encourage you and tell you that God loves you. And, um, and that's not a small thing. It's a big thing. And, um, he's really worthy of everything that you've got, um, to give to him. That's really what we're going to talk about tonight. Before we get into it, I brought two cars with me here today. Um, you may have noticed. Yeah. Um, I want to introduce you. I'm going to first introduce you to this car over here. This is my, uh, my friend Brandon's car. These girls are going to um, take off the, the car cover real quick. Um, yeah, shout out to, to Brandon who let me use his car because, as you're going to see, this car is pretty unbelievable. Um, yeah, so this is a, uh, a, a um, 1967 Ford Mustang. And um, this car actually has a name. Does anybody know this car's name? Eleanor. Eleanor. This car's name is Eleanor. And you know that if you're familiar with the movie Gone in 60 Seconds. Okay? So uh, just, if you just go ahead and play this video real quick. This is a quick shot. Uh, some of you guys are young, so you might not have seen this movie. Gone in 60 Seconds with Nick Cage. Um, we saved the best for last. The 67 Shelby Mustang GT500. The GT500. Yeah, yeah. There she is. Yep. There's Eleanor. Eleanor is Memphis's unicorn. What's a unicorn? Fable creature. You know, the horse with the horn, impossible to capture. It's the one card, no matter how many times you try to prove something always happens. Okay, this is that car, okay? So this is uh, not the exact same car, but this is the same type of car. Um, uh, this is one of the most highly sought after classic cars um, that, that you could get is a, is a 67 Ford Shelby um, uh, GT500 Mustang. And, um, and really, they're, they're really actually expensive. If you get a fully restored, they can go anywhere from like 100 to $300,000. This is like really a pristine, amazing car. I'm not gonna actually let you touch it or get in it, but if you, if you open the hood, if you got in, if you're able to drive it, God forbid, you would find out this car is an amazing piece of machinery, okay? This car is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful car. I brought another car I wanna show you guys. This is my friend Connor's car. It is also a Mustang. It's a little bit earlier. It's a 64 Mustang. Yeah, she's a beaut, isn't she? Um, Uh, no, it is not for sale. It's not for sale. Um, my friend Connor, let me borrow his car. Uh, and I want to show, real quick, before I go any further, I want to give mad props to my friend Aaron Reed, who helped get both of these cars on the stage, which is not an easy thing to do. So give it for Aaron Reed. He's got a few kids that are running around here somewhere. Um, so this is actually a 1964 Ford Mustang. Um, believe it or not, it does not have a name because nobody cares. Nobody would give this car. If we were gonna give it a name, what should we name it? Let's just name it right now. Jared, Bob, Buford. I'm calling this car. I'm calling this car. All right, thank you. I mean, I know you know this, 
because I'm sure it sounds exactly the same to you, but it just sounds like, ah, like I have no idea what you're saying at some point. We're going to call this car, Stop yelling your worst enemy's names. We're going to call this car Broke Down Burt, okay? Because um, it looks like a sad car. And if your name's Burt in here, I'm sorry, but that's kind of a sad name. And um, so that's what you get. But interestingly, listen, I actually want to talk for a minute about what's similar about these cars, okay? Both these cars um, are Ford Mustangs. Both of them are American-made muscle cars. And they really came out of what was kind of the, the most glory days of the Ford Motor Company, okay? The mid-1960s are like the greatest time in American car uh, manufacturing history, okay? And, and one of the reasons is because the, the, um, you know, the car industry early on was, was dominated by European cars. Americans made cars. We're actually the first ones to make cars, but we just made like utility cars. But the really nice cars, the Ferraris, the Porsches, the, you know, all those cars are are um, you know, Italian or German, or they're made in Europe. But Ford really set out in the 1960s to try to, try to build cars that could compete with the European cars. And, and there's a, a, a race in, in um, France every year called the Le Mans, the 24-hour Le Mans. And the 24-hour Le Mans is a race that's been happening since like the 1920s. And what it is, it's not like other races. It's, it's a race that lasts 24 hours, okay? And it's not the first one to cross the finish line. The winner of the Le Mans is the person who can travel the furthest in 24 hours on their track, okay? So the actual world record holder is from, from 2010. They travel uh, 3,360 miles, okay? Just to give you, in 24 hours, and to give you some clarity, from here to Boston is 3,001 miles, okay? So in 24 hours, they go drive all the way to Boston, and a third of the way back um, is the winner of the Le Mans. And so that's what the Le Mans works. And so it was, uh, in the early 1960s, it was dominated by Ferrari. Ferrari won five years in a row until 1966, when a, a group of engineers came together. There's actually a movie made about it. A group of engineers came together, and they made these Fords that could compete, the 4T, uh, I think it's a GT 3500 or 350, they could compete with these other cars. And it's at this time, I told you that, that um, it's called the Shelby, there's a guy named Carroll Shelby who was a, a designer and a maker and he helped make these early Mustangs that made them this iconic classic car. And really the winner of the Le Mans has a real hard claim on being the best car manufacturer in the world. And so for Ford to win, and then it won in 1967, in 1968, in 1969, it became one of the most iconic, important um, cars in the world. Now, when both these cars were bought, I can tell you something uh, about them. When, when, whenever the person who bought this car originally, I don't know who they were, but when they drove it off the lot, I can promise you one thing, I can promise you that they did not drive straight home. Okay, because I guarantee you that not only did they drive down the busiest street in their city or their town, but they drove by all of their friends' houses. Okay, because they this is the kind of car you don't just drive straight home. You want to show somebody this car. This car is a statement car. Okay, I can almost guarantee you something. Else. I don't know who bought these two cars, but I can almost guarantee you they were guys. Okay, because there's just something about muscle cars that dudes get that girls are like. I don't get it the same way. But I'll tell you this, if you're a girl, you're impressed with a man behind a muscle car, okay? Because probably the most important place the guy went was to the girl he likes house, okay? He drove this car and he went out front and he knocked on the door and he said, hey, how's it going? Oh, that? Oh yeah, it's my car. You wanna go for a ride? And she was like, I do, okay? Now that's about where the comparisons end between these two cars, okay? Because if some guy drives to your house in this car, ladies, do not open the door. I can almost guarantee you he's some kind of homeless drug addict who has bad intentions, okay? This is a criminal's car, okay? This is the kind of car you park four blocks away and walk to wherever you're trying to get to because you do not want to be seen in this car. Now, to, to be honest, wherever it parks, that's where it's going to stay because we had to tow this car in here. This car does not run. You might be surprised to find out. But this car is completely dead, okay? This car, though, interestingly, runs better than the day that it drove off the lot. 
This car is a fully restored. It is better in every way than when this car was originally purchased. You know, I wanted to tell you a quick story. Uh, I'm a big Padres fan. It's a hard life for Padre fans, but uh, it's been a, you know, you, the last time the Padres went to the World Series was 1998. This is before almost all of you were born. If, um, if you're here attending Future Quest as a student and you weren't, you were already born in 1998, you've like lost, like you've skipped a lot of grades or I mean like been held back a lot, okay? So, but in 1998, me and my buddies were, uh, were um, huge Padre fans and we were season ticket holders and the Padres won the National League pennant, which means they were the, the number one team in the National League and they're gonna go play the best team in the American League. And unfortunately that year, they ran into the New York Yankees, the 98 Yankees, one of the best teams of all time. And, um, and so, but the, 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 season, the series was gonna start in uh, New York and then was gonna come back to San Diego. And there was a, a sports radio station in San Diego called uh, uh, Extra Sports 690 and they were having a contest. They said, we're gonna give away two complete round trip airfare hotel tickets the World Series in New York to the biggest Padre fans. And, and it, it's, it's gonna happen tomorrow morning. You have to be at Seau's, which is a restaurant in Mission Valley, at 6 a.m. You show up at 6 a.m., we're gonna have a contest, the biggest Padre fan we're sending. They leave straight there for, in a limo, go to the airport, leave for New York. And me and my friend were like, we've got to win this. Okay, we have got to do this. And so we were like decked out all of our Padres gear. We painted our faces. We had wigs on. We're like planning it. We're staying up. It's two o'clock in the morning and we're, we're just getting ready. Like how, what can we do to show these guys how much we love the Padres and how bad we want to win this? And at one point in the night, it was late, remember, we decided, I know, I have an idea. At that point, I drove a 1986 Toyota Camry, okay? My friend worked at a vinyl shop and we said, I know what we'll do. Let's go outside and we'll put Padres on the side of your car in vinyl, like in huge letters, and the other side, New York or bust. And I was like, three o'clock in the morning, I was like, that's a great idea. Let's do it. So we drove down to his work and we, we made these, uh, these, these huge vinyl panels. We stuck them on the car. It's like huge stickers, basically. And we went there and, and we waited in line and there, we, you know, we're like thinking about all the other people that are coming up and we're like, oh my gosh, like, we have a shot at this. Like, there's not that many people here. And like, these people don't look like they're that big of Padre fans. Like, I think we might have a shot at this. And so we, um, we just, the night went on. It basically turned, or the, the morning went on. It basically turned out that some pod squad girls were gonna like pick the winners. And so we're like talking to them and kind of flirting with them and trying to, you know, just massage them a little bit to kind of pick us, you know? Um, and not really massage them, like just verbally massage them. Like, oh my gosh, you're, that's so funny. You're so smart, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, so. It got around to there was three finalists. It was us and this dad and his son and this other dad and son who uh, props to them, they should have won. It was the other dad and son who were wearing friar like outfits and they both shaved their head in the middle and like had like the hair. I was like, that's actually really cute. Those guys are gonna beat us. Um, and, then, and then it came down to us and this, these two, this dad and his son, I remember his dad, the dad was, you know, whatever my age and the son was like, like eight. And I remember they had this boom box and it was their turn to like show their stuff and they push on the boom box and it was the, um, it was the underdogs theme song. And, um, and then all of a sudden they were like, and they, they took their hats off and they had like little like underdog ears that came down and they like took, and they had underdog pajamas on. It was literally the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my entire life, okay? I, I, I can't express to you how dumb these guys looked and how foolish and I was like, <laughs> these guys are idiots. These are the only real competition. Somehow those guys won, okay? <laughs> and we just heartbroken. They never even looked at our car. It was inside a restaurant. They never went outside, they didn't even know. We go back and we're just, stay up all night working on this thing. We got ready, we started, uh, um, get, went to my car, you know, started taking the stickers off and took out the Padre sticker and it came off fine. And it took off the New Yorker bus and we started taking off the inn in New York and it starts to peel the paint. The paint just comes off with it. Every single one of those stickers came off just like that. My car, for the next however long I had it, said New York or bust on the side of it. I'd pull up to, to like stoplights and people would be like, what does that mean? And I'd be like, just like I just leave, you know? I didn't even wanna talk about it. It was so painful, so painful memory, okay? That car was terrible. It was a piece, okay? That car was way better than this car, okay? I don't know if you can see this car. This car is completely rusted out. If you got inside this car, it looks like a bum's nest in there. It looks like just homeless people have been living in there. It looks terrible. This is a terrible car. This car is beautiful. 
It's amazing. Now, I want to ask you a question. How do you think this car ended up like this? What, how do you end up with a car that is that janky, that is that broke down, that is that messed up? It's a rhetorical question. I'm going to tell you. Here's what you do if you want to make sure you have a car like that. You do nothing. Don't do anything. This is actually what a 50-year-old car looks like. Okay? If you just drive it around, if you just do nothing, this is what it ends up being like. Okay, listen, as you're driving your car, you're going to hit potholes. You're going to have bugs fly in. You're gonna, I mean, it has a combustion engine, so there's explosions happening every millisecond inside the, the engine of this car. You're going you're gonna to scrape things. You're going to bump into things. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, if, if you live by um, Carl, you know, your, your whole side of your car is going to get ripped off probably. Like, there's other people on the road, all kinds of things. You don't actually have to do anything to get a jacked up car like this. You just have to have it and then do nothing and it will get jacked up. Sun, rain, road, it will just jack it up over time. This is what we call, in, in, in physics, they have something to explain. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. And a short way of saying it is entropy. And what, what that means is it just every system, without new energy or effort put into it, is going to break down over time. It's going to devolve into disorder. There's a story about um, Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs owned a, a big piece of land, and there was a house on the land. And he, and he wanted to get rid of the house. The problem was the house was considered a historical landmark. And so um, he went to the city council and he said, said I'd like to, I'd like to uh, bulldoze this house and build a new house. And a bunch of you know, eco people uh, came up and said, no, 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 you can't do that. This is a historic house. You can't, you can't um, knock this house down. And they, so they ruled against him. And Steve, and Steve Jobs just said, okay, then I'm just going to go open the doors and windows. And over time, what's going to happen is that nature will take care of this problem for me. Nature will bulldoze this house for him because if you just open your doors and windows, you know what's going to happen before long? Animals are going to get in there. Plants are going to start to grow in there. Roots are going to sprout up. And that's what he did. And you saw inside this house, there was like, like all kinds of, of trees and all kinds of things growing inside of his house because he, this second law of thermodynamics, that there's the world just works towards brokenness. If you don't do anything, the natural state of things is that it moves towards brokenness and disrepair. The natural state of this car is normal. Our theme this year for Future Quest is renew. That's what all these messages, all these things we've been talking about, we're trying to talk about this theme of renewal, that God wants to renew us. And I have these cars up here because they illustrate something that I, I want to try to get in your brain. I want to try to put in your mind for you to understand. How do you get a car like this from a car like this? Well, I'll tell you. It takes a lot of hard work. And it takes not just a lot of hard work. Because I'll tell you, I'm not, I'm not like a car restorer guy. Like, I can appreciate this car. But I'll tell you, like this car, I wouldn't know the first place to start. I could work really hard on this car, and in six months, it'll probably look worse, okay? Because it's not just a lot of hard work. It also needs some expert skill, some expert understanding on, on how to rebuild an engine, on how to rebuild paneling, on how to do upholstery, on how to restore a car. Now, Jesus said that he came to give life and life abundant. You know, in many ways, this car represents the kind of life that God wants for you to have. He wants for you to, not, not just like a beautiful car, or like a fancy car, or one to show off, but he wants you to have a good life. He wants you to have a life that is full of the spirit of God, that is, uh, that is full of strength and comfort in God's grace and his power and his strength. He wants you to know the love of God. He wants you to know the peace that surpasses all understanding. He wants to make you the bride of Christ, a people set apart for his own possession. You think about a bride on her wedding day. Most women never look more beautiful than they look on their wedding day, right? That's who God came. He came for a, a, a people that are holy, that are sanctified, that are beautiful. 
That's kind of what this card represents. But, you know, the truth is that sometimes God comes and, and a lot of our lives look a lot more like this car. Broke, busted up. Broke down. And, and look, that's just because life happens. And sometimes it's not even anything you did. Sometimes it's just things that happen to you. Sometimes you're born into a messed up family or a messed up situation. Sometimes people hurt you. Other people's sin comes in, you know, towards you and gets on you and affects you. Sometimes it, it, in those situations, we sin against people. Sometimes it's just life. Sometimes you just get sick. You get hurt. You deal with depression. You deal with anxiety. Your parents get divorced. Somebody bullies you at school. And just life ends up taking its toll. It ends up grinding on you. And God, is, God has this for you. He wants this for you and you know it, but actually your life looks more like this. Some of you guys, your life looks like this, but you have no idea. You don't know. You think you look like this, but you don't. This is you. I'll be honest with you. A lot of you, that's the situation. I mean, you're doing your best. You put your clothes on. You're trying to keep up good appearance on the outside. But if we could see what actually went on your heart, what actually went on your mind, it would be something more like this. It's banged up. It's got some dents. The pain is scratched. Rust is starting to show through. The windshield is cracked. It's not running good. It's about to break down. I want to look this evening in a story in the Bible about a man whose life breaks down. The man is David. Probably every person here is familiar of David's most famous exploit, which is him and Goliath, where he defeats him. And one of the great things about David is we have a lot of information about David in the Bible. It tells us all kinds of information about him. And there's not that many people that we, we learn a lot about in the Bible that we get so much information about. But David, we get a ton of information. And a lot of it reads like a real hero's tale. He, he defeats a lion, a bear. He defeats Goliath. He, he ends up becoming the king over all of Israel. He writes many of the Psalms. He's a poet. He's a worshiper. He's a prophet. In fact, God said of David, he's a man after my own heart. David for the most part in the Bible looks really great, except there's one part of the Bible in which David utterly fails. In fact, it's, it's sort of a, a short window of his life, and yet the catastrophe of his choices and his sin is epic, monumental. Talking about the story of David and Bathsheba, a story of moral failing and the stunning fall from grace that David experienced. It's in 2 Samuel 11. We're going to read, uh, I'll read the first parts of it and then we're going to get into it. 2 Samuel 11, 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men. And the whole Israelite army, they and the whole Israelite army, they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but King David remained in Jerusalem. Okay. It says, at the time when kings go off to war, David remained in Jerusalem. David's the king. It says that he should be off to war, but he remained in Jerusalem. I want to give you just real quick, as we look through this, I want to give you three steps on David's path to sin. And here's the first step. David was not where he was supposed to be. Listen, this is going to be important in your life as you just try to navigate and avoid sin. Is you want to learn from other people. There's two ways to learn things. You can learn from experiencing yourself or you can learn from other people. Consequences of sin, as much as possible, you want to learn from other people. So learn from David right here. David was not where he was supposed to be. How many of you guys have ever found yourself in a place that you knew you should not be? You don't want to go there, and that's where we find David. He's not where God would have had him. He's not where he's supposed to be. And that's where his first step towards sin goes. Verse two, it says, One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the, the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Okay. 
Second thing is this. He sees something he shouldn't see. He sees something that he should not see. Now, I don't want to blame David for seeing Bathsheba taking bath. It doesn't sound like he was like, had his binoculars out and was like trying to scope on this woman. Okay? It says that, that he got up and he just walked out on his roof. That would have been normal for him as palace roof. And he looks over and he sees a woman taking a bath. And the Bible goes out of its way to say she was very beautiful. <coughs> the Bible doesn't usually say that about how people look. This woman must have been stunning. And so David sees it. Could he have helped himself from seeing it? Well, if he was away at war, he wouldn't have seen it. But otherwise, it's not his fault that he sees her. But what he did ex- right after that is his fault. What he should have done is he should have gone and talked to his mom. <laughs> mom, how's it going? Can you make me a sandwich? Just let's sit down and talk, right? He, he could have gone for a long walk and gotten out of there, okay? He could have gone to one of his advisors and said, I need to confess something to you. I just saw this thing. It's crazy. I didn't want to see it. I'm so sorry. Some of you guys have seen things that you shouldn't see. And the seeing the thing is not your fault. Some of you guys, you weren't looking for something. You had somebody come up and say, hey, check this out. You opened something and you didn't know what it was. And all of a sudden, boom, there's something you shouldn't see in front of you. That's not your fault, but what you do with it is your fault. You have a choice at that moment. C.S. Lewis said, you can't stop a bird from flying up and landing on your head, but you can keep it from making a nest there, right? And so David's sin is this. David sees it, and then he looks, and then he stares, and he lingers, and his mind begins to move, and he begins to lust after this woman. And so there he is, minding his own business, goes out for a walk on the roof, and all of a sudden, he has, the temptation comes to him, and he has a moment where he has a choice to make. Do I run from this, or do I think about it? One of the most important things in regards to pornography or whatever um, we tell our kids is if you see pornography, here's, the first thing you do is look away. The second thing you do is you say, that's pornography. That's sin. And then you get away and you go tell somebody. Okay? It's important to name it what it is. And David makes a mistake here of not naming it. And he lingers. In 2 Samuel 11:3, it says, And David sent someone to find out about her. And the man came back and said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, I don't know who this guy is that David sent, but I'll tell you this. He's a godly man. The man, the servant that David sent to find out about that woman is a godly man because he comes back and here's what he says. That is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David, this is another man's daughter and this is another man's wife. That's who she is. Now, David committed his third where he said he, pers- he says he pursued something he should not pursue. He sent somebody to find out about her. What we're going to find out next is making up his mind, he sent someone to go get her. Gentlemen, it's really important for you to remember when you're dealing with women, whether it's a girl you're interested in, whether it's just a friend, whether it's your girlfriend, that she is another man's daughter. And if you do not marry her, she will be most likely another man's wife. So often we are so cavalier, we are so thoughtless, we're so careless with how we treat people. So David sent a message to get her, and she came to him, and he slept with her. And verse 4 says, then she went back home. Now here we have David. God has said about him, he is a man after my own heart. He's a prophet, he's a worshiper, he's a godly man. 
And in the span of a few minutes, he has risked it all and committed adultery with this woman. You know, so often that's how sin works. That's how sin can just sneak up on you. It creeps around like a roaring lion, seeking people to devour. And I don't know what David thought as, she, as he watched her walk out of his palace. But I gotta believe it, if he's a godly man, immediately regret and sorrow hit his heart. Immediately shame for what he had done came in. And I just imagine him just being broken, weeping. And I wonder what he thought about he should do next. Should he confess his sin? Should he tell? Unfortunately for David, he tries to hide it. And the problem is compounded when about a month later, Bathsheba comes back. And she says, David, I'm pregnant. Now, now listen. Listen. I don't want you to miss this. This is important. I told you, God has something good for you. I want you to hear it tonight. And David, that's a huge problem for David because there's no question who the babies is. Because her husband, Uriah, has been out to war. He hasn't been home. And so David knows he's caught. And he knows as soon as Uriah comes home and finds his wife pregnant, there's going to be big problems. And his sin is going to be put on display and everybody's going to see it. And have you ever been in a moment where you know you just got caught or you're about to get caught and you just panic? Like, just tear, like, oh, no. Like, oh, and your mind just, what, can I do anything? Is there any way to me avoid this? Please, 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 please. Uh, what, I, I used to have a job where I caught shoplifters, okay? And I've seen people where that moment where they thought they were going to get this new thing or get away with it, and now they're sitting there in handcuffs and they're being arrested, and I've seen so many say, please, no, 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 no. And I say, if they're minors, I say, I need to call your parents. And I say, they're like, take me to jail. <laughs> Do not call my parents. That moment when you start to panic, well, David starts to panic, and then he, he gets an idea. He says, okay, I'm going to send a messenger. I'm going to bring Uriah back from the battlefield. And I'll just say, I want to get a, an update on how the war is going. And then I'll let Uriah spend the night. He'll go home to his wife and then he'll sleep with her because he's been away for like, um, you know, three months or something. And, and then uh, I'll send him back out. And then when the baby, it'll come a little bit early, but nobody will know. It'll be close enough and, and I'll, be, I'll get away with it. So that's what he does. He sends for Uriah, Uriah comes home, gives him a report on the war. And he says, Uriah, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your hard work. Listen, why don't you go home, enjoy your family, and tomorrow we'll send you back to the, the front lines. And Uriah leaves, and David's watching, thinking, thank goodness. Thank goodness my plan worked, except Uriah doesn't go home. The Bible says that Uriah sleeps on the steps with his servants. And the next morning, David calls Uriah. Uriah, what's up, dude? I said to go home, enjoy your family. He said, far be it from me. While my brothers and my countrymen are out there fighting for our country, for me to go home and be with my wife, let it never be. See, so you find out at this moment that Uriah is a much more faithful man than David is, and a more godly man. So David, this panic sets in again. He thinks, okay, I, I, I got one more shot. Okay, so he says, listen, stay tonight, dine with me, and then we'll send you home tomorrow. And, and they dine, and he says, listen, have a have a glass of wine, have another, have another. And his plan is he's going to get Uriah drunk. And once Uriah is drunk, he'll stumble home. And then, you know, his, his, his inhibitions will, will drop. He won't be so, um, so honorable and, and he'll go home. And he gets him drunk. And Uriah stumbles out of the palace. Except he doesn't go home again. He sleeps with the servants. And the next morning, David, he's tried everything. And now when, when Uriah finds out, he's going to know that David tried to trick him, tried to lie about it, tried to, tried to cover it up. And David, this man after God's own heart, this prophet of God, this worshiper, does something in a moment that I wish he, I bet he spent every moment of the rest of his life wishing that he could undo. 
He wrote out a letter to Joab. And he gave it to Uriah. He said, I want you to give this to Joab. And the letter said, I want you to put Uriah at the very front of the battle where it's the hottest. And, it, and right when it peaks, I want all the other soldiers to pull back from Uriah. He gives that message to Joab. Joab does it, he puts him out there, and Uriah is killed. So David murders. Let me ask you just a quick question. This is just extra, but anybody here have a friend like Joab? A friend who's going to help you do the wrong thing? Okay, David knew in that moment he could count on Joab because Joab was an immoral man. Joab was a man without scruples. And David, I'm sure he felt abhorred. I'm sure he felt guilty about what he had done. But he said, listen, I'm going to go, I'm going to do an honorable thing. I'm going to go marry the widow of Uriah. He marries Bathsheba. And he just goes on with his business. About nine months later, Bathsheba gives birth, and they have a baby boy. You must not have heard the rest of the story. (laughs) And about that time, he gets a knock on his door. And he opens the door, and who does he see there? But he sees the man of God, the prophet Nathan. Nathan, my brother, come in. Come dine with me. And Nathan comes in, but... Nathan had a message for David. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men. I want to tell you a story. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he brought up and he raised it and he gave it, he grew up with his children. It shared his food, his drink, his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him, this little baby lamb. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the little lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. means he took that lamb that belonged to the poor man and he killed it and he cooked it and he gave it to the man to eat. It says in verse 5 that David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and he had no pity. And then Nathan looked him straight in the eyes and said to David, you are the man. You are the man who stole another man's wife. You took what was not yours What I had given to another man and you took it for yourself, sinfully and dishonorably. And then when you're going to get caught, you had that man put to death. And you've been walking around here like you're a godly man. And you've been walking in this wickedness. And here's where I just, this whole thing is to get to us to this one spot. It was that moment that Nathan said to him, he said, this child that is born to you in Bathsheba is going to die because of your sin. And David, you deserve death yourself, but I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to let you live. And so that David went into the house of the Lord and he began to fast and he began to pray that this child would live. And the moment Nathan left, the child got sick, and a few days later, the child died. It says David got up, and he cleansed himself, and he went into the house of the Lord, and he began to worship God. And here's something that happened. We get actually another one of the Psalms, one of the most famous Psalms, Psalm 51. We get David's prayer to God. After all of this had happened, and we get the point where David finally does what's right. He finally comes back to the Lord. And I want to just look at it. I want to go through it really quick, and I'm going to go... I'm going to go fast. In fact, if a band wants to come out here. Psalm 51, there's a little tagline above it. It says, for the director of music, a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. This whole prayer is David's prayer after all of this had happened. Psalm 51, starting in verse 1 and 2, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions and wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
You know, David, this whole time, he's been trying to cleanse himself from the sin. He's been trying to wash this sin off of his hands. He's been trying to get rid of this guilt, this shame, what he had done. And this psalm is a turning, it's a recognition. God, I need your mercy. I need your help. You're the only one who can do what I need done. He's been running from God. He's been hiding from God. And now he comes to God as a broken man, needing his forgiveness. Listen, I want to say, if you're in here, it's likely that you've never killed someone before. And I, sh- I really hope and pray that there's, people in, that there's no one in here who's ever raped anyone before. But if you're thinking that you're any different than David, I want to tell you you're not. Your sin is just a big problem for you as David's sin was for him. Every single one of us in here, we have unclean hands. We have unclean hearts. And the the most natural thing in the world is to try to get yourself clean. But I want to tell you that's not how it works. You can't clean yourself up. Verse 3, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. My sin is constantly in my mind. It's constantly there in front of me. It's constantly being relived. And he says, uh, this this is such a weird thing. He says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That's a weird thing to say. Against you and you only? Hey, I think you sinned against Bathsheba. I think you you sinned against Eliam. I think you sinned against, against Uriah. What do you mean against you and you only have I sinned, O Lord? We get a hint in verse 5. It says, surely I was sinful at birth and sinful from the time my mother conceived me. As David is is processing through all this stuff and, and all the things that happened to him, you know what he's realizing? This thing that happened with Bathsheba and Uriah, it wasn't just a crazy one off thing that had happened. In fact, it was, it was something that happened because of, of all these years of, of uncontrolled thoughts. That all these little compromises, all these little, little prideful self-indulgences that he had allowed. All the little jealousies, all the little covetousness. And over those years, those things begin to add up and those little, those little sins inside of him. They thought weren't that big of a deal. Little white lies, little small things. They were all there. They were all present. How many little sins do we have that we just hold on to and we think are not a big deal? Until you understand your sin, you're never really going to appreciate God's love or his grace. We talk about the gospel, we talk about the good news of Jesus Christ is that you can be forgiven for your sins, but if you don't know the bad news first, the good news will never be that good to you. The bad news is that you are a whole galaxy of sins. You have in your heart And in your mind, all these little things, all these little choices, all these little, these little allowances, these little compromises, and we we let them all go and we think, that's no big deal. It's so much better than my friends. I watch that, I think that, I do that, but I don't know, does God really care about that? There's really bad people in the world. But he does. And David here is coming to grips that, Lord, my problem is with you. My problem is not with other people. My problem is not even really with Bathsheba and Uriah, my son that died. My problem is with God. Look, some of you guys have problems with people in your life and you think it's about them. It's not. It's about your problem with God. Against you and you only have I sinned. And then in verse 7 it says, Cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. 
Lord, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. I can't fix myself. I can't fix this. I need your help. And then in, in verse 10 is our theme verse for future quests. It says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew, say renew, a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, don't cast me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, but would you restore to me the joy of your salvation? Lord, would you grant me a willing spirit and would you sustain me? Saying, God, would you take me and make me new again? Would you bring new life into me? Would you restore my soul? It says, then I'll teach transgressors your ways. Listen, it says, well, if you do this for me, God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend the rest of my life teaching sinners your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O oh God. You are my Savior. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open lips, Lord. My mouth will declare your praise. Here's what God wants. God wants you to come in your brokenness. I told you earlier, I said that I have these cars up here to illustrate what we're like. We want to be this because of sin and brokenness, our sin, other people's sin, we end up like this. And I said it's only through a lot of work and a lot of skill that you can become like this. But I want to tell you, the car can't do it to itself. The car needs a man to come and work on it. A man to come and fix it. That man is Jesus. And I want to say that, that wherever you're at, if whatever kind of brokenness you have in your life, whatever kind of, of failures you have, whatever kind of emptiness, God's saying, come to me and I can, I can make you into something new. Now, I was thinking about this. One of the things I was, I was thinking about is I, I'm, I'm 43 now. I'm about to be 44 in a couple, in a couple weeks. And I was, back there, I was crying. Because I was thinking like, Lord, would you help, Lord, these young people, God, to know how beautiful you are? Lord, would you help them to know how worth it you are? Would you help them know how precious you are? And I was thinking about my own life, and I was thinking about when I was growing up, my dad was a drug addict and alcoholic. And I was thinking about how when I was, gone, when I was young, he was gone all the time. And even when he got clean, then my parents split up, and they got divorced, and I was a kid who lived in two different houses. And, and um, I remember growing up in junior high and high school, and I remember not having a lot of friends, not really fitting in, trying really hard, failing, pretty miserably. I remember saying, I don't know that I have what it takes. I don't know that I have what it takes to follow God. I don't know if I have what it takes to, to live the kind of life that I know God has for me to live. I was broken. And as I was, I was worshiping back there, I was thinking about that, I was looking at our band. And, and, and these guys are my friends. And I was thinking about Brianna. And how Brianna, when she was a little girl, her mom died. It just left her with her dad and her brother and her. Her brother was older, and so her brother was out more. And so, and then her, her dad got sick, really sick. And for most of Brianna's life, junior high and high school, she had to take care of her dad. She had to do everything. She had to run the house. There was no mom there, and her dad could not help take care of himself. And so she had to take him to dialysis. She had to help him. She had to buy all the groceries. She had to clean the house. She had to run everything. She had to go to school, and she had to live her own life. And so she, she had fear and anxieties and all the things you would get in that situation. She was broken. I was thinking about Shane. I was thinking about how I met Shane when he was in the sixth grade. He was in my junior high group. Now, I remember I used to drive Shane home afterwards. And when I say home, I want to tell you what I mean. I mean, he, I, would say, I would say, where's your house? He'd say, I don't have a house. So my mom is staying on El Cajon Boulevard. And I'd say, where is she staying? He'd say, I don't know. And we would drive up and down the motels on El Cajon Boulevard looking for Shane's mom. Shane's mom was an alcoholic. When he was a freshman in high school, his mom was found dead on the street of alcoholism. Matt's story is a little bit like mine. Matt 
Matt grew up in a broken family too. Divorce. When I met Matt in the seventh grade, I, I, I knew Matt for about two years before I ever heard him say one word. He was the shyest, most like reserved, quiet kid in the entire world. He had no confidence. Melinda lived in the world, high school and college, and has all the brokenness that comes along with it. Didn't know Jesus. I want to say these four people and me who are speaking to you, and if I, I went through and I talked about all these other people, you could find they're just broken people. We're not the strongest we're not the best. We're not the smartest. We're just broken people, broken by our own sin and broken by other people's sin. And yet God is, is using these guys. He's using me, and he wants to use you to proclaim the excellencies of the living God to, be, to demonstrate his kindness and his grace and his love. To show a dark world what a loving God really is. This is how he does it. This is how David ends. He says, Lord, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. I'd offer them. Listen to this. Here's, please, please hear me. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart you, God, will not despise. And David's just saying, Lord, the only thing I have to offer you is the only thing any of us really have to offer to God. It is a broken spirit. It is a broken and a contrite heart. It's a penitent heart. It's one that just says, God, I, I don't have anything. I don't have anything worth anything, Lord, but, but I give it to you. I give my busted, broken down life to you. Because God, I want you more than I want anything. I want you more than I want to be king. I want you more than I want my wife. Lord, I want you more than I want to live. Lord, it's got to be you. And here we are at the end of Future Quest, and, and my prayer this whole time is, God, would you break us? Would you break us for our sin? Would you break us for, for would, you, would you allow us to be crushed? So that, Lord, we might be useful to you. The only kind of people that God really uses are broken people. Would you bow your heads? The question here at the end of this future quest is, will you give God your broken heart? The sacrifice that God finds to be acceptable and that God is after is a broken and a contrite spirit. In a minute, we're going to linger tonight. We're going to just spend time worshiping God and spending time in his presence, spending time ministering. And so we're going to have lots of time. I don't want you to feel like you got to hurry up and get out of here. There's no concert tonight. There's no extra thing here. We're just going to spend time just in the presence of the Lord. Just worshiping, but I, I want to tell you in a minute, I'm going to say, if, if that's you, if this, if this evening, at the end of future, if you just want to say, God, I, I just give it to you, Lord. I give you my heart. Lord, I have a broken and a contrite heart, but I surrender it to you. I'm going to ask you to come down here. We're going to, we're going to have the adults come down, and we're just going to pray prayers that God would draw near to you that he would fill you with his presence, that he would fill you with his love, 
that those parts of you that are weak and that are low, that God would begin to fill in. He'd begin to strengthen. The parts where you have undealt with sin that is, that, that is still raging against God, that God would begin to tear those things down. And that you would give them to him. That's what I want you to do. If you're going to leave this future quest by laying down your life to him, by giving yourself again as a sacrifice, I'm not asking any requirement. You don't have to be in any kind of shape. You could be busted up, messed up. God's not waiting for you to get it together. I want you to just come down here to the front. Go ahead and come right now, if that's you. Don't clap. Please don't clap. Hey, man, don't clap. This isn't, this, this clearly just, this is not for everybody. This is not something you do because somebody else is doing it or, or you do together. This is not a group project. You're just saying, God, I, I, I'm laying down my life here. I want you to take this messed up little bit that I have to give to you, and, and Lord, I want you to come and have your way. You guys in the middle, if you guys come forward just a little bit, there's more people come behind you. We're gonna worship the Lord, and, and um, we're just gonna pray a blessing over you. We're gonna pray that God... Um, would really draw near to you. And that he began to do the work, the work that's necessary to take something that's busted up and make it something good, make it something beautiful. Lord, would you come? We're gonna, we're gonna worship quietly. If you guys are in our seats, if you guys wanna stand, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna worship, but... Um, you guys up here in the front, we're just the adults if you guys want to start just praying God's, God's, um, God's nearness, his love, his grace, his peace. Let's do that now.